Okay, so I need to take my mind off things, so I decided to make a kombucha video. I've been getting texts from my friend. Hi, Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay is beautiful. You guys have met her before. She lives in Czech, and she wants to know how to brew kombucha. So I'm having a rough day. I thought instead of moping and sitting and staring at the wall, I would let you guys know everything you ever never wanted to know about kombucha. So this will be for anyone who, let's just say you don't know anything about it at this point and you might want to brew at the end of this and I'll help you with materials, the history, the benefits, and just random stuff that you need to know. So uh, kombucha is this thousand year old, many thousands of year old process of fermenting a tea and it creates this uh, byproduct of a SCOBY. And SCOBY, as you hopefully may know, is symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. SCOBY. I call them SCOBES sometimes. And your SCOBY is formed at the top of your tea layer, and that will help with the fermentation process. It creates all these aminos and it's like a bacteria and yeast that will ferment and make the tea very vinegary and it's an acquired taste. A lot of people like it. I personally love it. And the reason that it's good is it has all these probiotics and nutrients and it's very good for your digestional health and it also acidify or it is a very acidic drink and therefore it will alkalize your body and it's healthy for that reason. So why you want to make your own kombucha? First of all, it's pretty expensive. When you buy it in the store, it's anywhere from, if it's on sale, maybe $2 a bottle. Usually it's about 3 or 4 And it's great to support local companies. If you have a favorite kombucha, go ahead and keep buying it if you want. But I would say that when you brew it, you are saving a tremendous amount of money. When you're making it yourself, it costs probably about a dollar a gallon, $2 a gallon, depending on what kind of tea and sugar you're using. So... The things that you're going to need to start brewing kombucha for the very first time is a clear glass jar container and the wider the better because however wide it is that's how wide your scoby is going to grow and the more surface area of the scoby the quicker the fermentation the healthier all that good stuff. So. What you need to start out with is only a few cups of starter tea. And starter tea just means raw kombucha. So you could either buy it from the store in a bottle or get some from a friend. But you need that starter tea because kombucha is very, very interesting in that uh, any starter tea will grow its own scoby. So when you go to the store and you get that bottle of GT Synergy uh, kombucha, you'll notice that there are strands of cultures already in there. And that's because it's just continuing to form on its own. So if you were to take that bottle and uncap it, let it breathe, it would grow its own tiny bottle-sized scoby within a few days and it'll be formed fully within a few weeks. So if you were to go to the store right now and buy two or three bottles of raw with the mother, or not with the mother, but um, just raw kombucha, and you started that, you would have your own SCOBY. So that's what we're hoping to do right now. So you're going to need the glass container. You're going to need something to put on the top that can let air through, but won't let dirt and dust and cat hair and cooking oils and cigarette smoke, something that will keep all the bad pathogens out and the fruit flies. You're going to attract some fruit flies because they love the smell of this vinegar mixture. And you need to make sure that they're not able to get in there because that is gross. So you're going to have something that's kind of permeable for air because the SCOBY wants to breathe. It's a living organism, but you're going to keep all the bad stuff out. So you're going to need glass jar, starter tea, either a paper towel or a reusable kitchen washcloth something and you're going to want to secure that with a rubber band or electrical tape or a string, something to keep it snugly fitting on there. And you're going to need plain sugar. Uh, a lot of people, I've heard about experimentation. Some people have tried honey, maple syrup, people have tried agave. I don't mess with that. I think that the best thing that you can use is just organic sugar, plain and simple.
it needs to eat the sugar to process and form the SCOBY. So how do I explain that better? The SCOBY wants two things, or I guess three things. It wants to be left alone and it wants to live. And the two things that it wants are caffeine and sugar. It's like a little speed addict. So what you have is you have your starter tea and you're gonna add a little bit of sugar and that's enough to just grow your own SCOBY right there. And you may be thinking this is supposed to be healthy. Why am I putting sugar in here? Why am I using any kind of sugar processed foods? This is bad. Uh, the SCOBY will convert most, if not all of the sugar, so don't worry about it, okay? It's just using those carbohydrates to fuel itself and create a more vinegar acidic tea. So you're not consuming all of this sugar. You don't need to worry too much. And you're gonna be using tea, that's the final thing. So you're gonna to wanna to use either a green tea, a black tea, or possibly a white tea, but it needs to be a very basic, one ingredient, just tea. You don't wanna get fancy and try to use orange infused tea or bergamot or something like that because that can potentially kill your SCOBY. And that would be very bad and sad and you you don't want to do that, so keep it simple. It wants caffeine via the tea, and it wants sugar via plain sugar, and that's the most basic. Just start out with that if you want to experiment later, or you read an article, you want to try that. I would recommend starting with the basics, what I'm telling you. So, okay, it's random tip time. I've already mentioned that SCOBYs do not like to be in contact with other uh, superfluous extraneous things, no substances like uh, fruit juice. If you're going to be flavoring it with ginger or something, that's great, but don't have it touch your mother's scoby. What you want is to separate out, you want to pour off what you're going to be drinking, and then you can flavor anything you want, but the scoby shouldn't come into contact with any of that stuff. Your scoby does not like metal. It does not like airborne bacteria stuff. It does not like to be moved around a lot. It does not like direct sunlight. Uh, your SCOBY does not like to be in very, very warm conditions or very, very, very cold conditions. If you're comfortable, like anywhere from, I don't know, maybe 60 to 80 degrees, that's the optimal temperature. If it's warmer, it's going to grow and ferment faster. If it's colder, obviously the inverse, it's going to be slower growing. Therefore, if you need to go on vacation and you want it to take a little break and go dormant, you can actually put your cover, well you sh your cover should be on, but have your cover on and stick it in the fridge and then you can take like a two month break from brewing and it'll just chill out for that time. Uh, it's not an ideal system, but if you have to go somewhere, you have to go somewhere and that'll keep it from brewing as quickly and you won't have your, like, your pH get lowered drastically over that time. So that being said, what is the pH and what is pH in general? pH, chemistry, uh, that measures the acidity or alkalinity or neutrality of uh, any given substance, any organic material. So we have a pH. If you peed on a pH strip, it would come out. If you put it in your mouth, you get your saliva pH level. pH is very important, and neutral is 7. Acidic is anything below that, so 6, 5, 4. And then if you were to take lemon juice, that would be around like a 2.5, a, a 3. And if you were to look at baking soda, that would be very alkaline up there is in the 10s and 11s. And I just got a text message. Get out of here. So that's distracting. Uh, we are looking to have a pH for your kombucha anywhere around 4 and 3. Anything below that isn't really fit for human consumption. It's too acidic. It's not good for our stomachs to have a lot. So... What we want is something around the three and a half, four level. And what you can do to test your pH is buy some very inexpensive, spend anywhere from a dollar to five dollars for these little testing strips. And you can just put a little bit of kombucha on there and see it'll turn a nice color. It should be like a nice red, rosy orange red color. And that will signify that your pH is in this particular, or at least that's the color that mine turned. I think that maybe if you got a different kit, it would be a different color, but anyway getting ahead of myself. So there are many things to talk about when talking about brewing kombucha. You want to make sure that your SCOBY is not sitting in some mixture that's very neutral. A mistake that's common is to put your sweet tea, which I'll talk about in a second, 
into your SCOBY mix and not have enough starter tea and that causes the pH to be very neutral and that's the perfect environment for mold to grow and you have heard about this before if you've researched kombucha. From time to time people get mold on their SCOBY and it's very easy to tell. It looks like moldy cheese so it'll grow these rings and spots of mold right on the surface of the SCOBY and that's the point where you have to throw it away. There's no use trying to scrape it off or save it. You just, you lost your SCOBY dude. I'm sorry, you gotta start over. So the way to prevent mold from growing is to make sure that your SCOBY is sitting in a mixture of tea that is very acidic already. It should never be above five. If it is, you're prone to mold. So the system is, once you have your SCOBY grown from your starter tea, and by the way, that should take anywhere from in about a week, you'll see the layer forming. In about two weeks, you'll have a little bit of a thicker layer, and your SCOBY should be done anywhere from two to three weeks. And it'll be thin at first. Every time your SCOBY gets discur uh, disturbed and a layer of liquid settles on top, it will start to grow another one. So every time you harvest some of your new batch out and you put in new sweet tea, and you leave a little bit of starter tea, remember, but every time you pour off your tea to drink, that's disturbing the SCOBY and it will grow a new layer. So that's called the baby layer. You have your mother underneath and above it, you'll have the new baby. And they will meld together if you leave them. You can have, some people like to separate them out, but you can have them stay together and they will just become thicker and thicker and thicker. Every month or so you'll get a new baby. And I have my SCOBY now. I have so many, but uh, most of them are about this thick. You know, it's like a year's worth of of melding together and you could probably separate them. I don't like to touch my SCOBY. I like to respect it and leave it alone, give it some personal space. So <sighs> there's so much to talk about. I'm sorry. This is probably going to be about a 20 minute video, just a warning, but by the end of it, I'm hoping that you will know everything that you would ever need to know. So I'm just trying to get this out there, get all the knowledge, and then you can go and do your own thing. So the first step is getting all the materials together, your glass, your, I would just say green tea, uh, glass, green tea, your sugar, and your clean water, and your vessel, and your covering. So you've got all that stuff, you've put in your starter tea, which is what you bought from the store, or you got just some kombucha from a friend, and you've left it alone for about two weeks, three weeks, and it's very tempting to want to like jiggle it and play with it. I would just give it some space, and you've got your SCOBY formed. From that point, you want to add your sweet tea. And sweet tea is the mixture that you'll be putting in every so often. Every time you harvest it out, you're going to want to add your sweet tea. And that is the food of the SCOBY that gets converted to make more kombucha. So your sweet tea is simply a mixture of water that is used to brew the tea and then adding sugar and that's it. And... The way that you're going to do this, what I do is I usually just use my electric tea kettle to heat about a half gallon or so of water and I don't make it boiling, boiling hot. I just make it hot enough to brew the tea. I try not to kill all of the tea. Uh, you know, you just want it warm, hot enough to take out the tea and the caffeine. So I will use anywhere from, it's not an exact science, I hate to say this, but it, it's really about gut intuition and what you feel is best for you. And you're going to use anywhere from maybe about one tea bag per cup of water or maybe one tea bag per two cups of water. So it's just like you're making tea for yourself, you know, and it's just a little bit of trial and error, or perhaps you could read an article that you trust online and you could use their ratio. But what I do is I use instinct and I say about one tea bag per cup of water. So I heat that water, I brew it, and you always want to do this in a separate container. Your SCOBY does not like extreme heat. You can kill it. Please do not pour warm water, anything but room temperature liquid on your SCOBY. Okay? This is, treat it like a baby. It's a little a little baby it doesn't want to have boiling water poured over it you're gonna burn it just like you would okay so you're gonna take your sweet tea you're gonna let it cool down and how much sugar that's the question okay I like to add a lot of sugar because I like it to ferment pretty quickly so I would say maybe a cup of white sugar per half gallon of sweet tea so you've got about one tea bag per cup of water, 
and about a half cup of sugar, no, excuse me, a cup of sugar per half gallon of tea. And then once that's all cooled down, if you'd like, you can add some ice cubes to help take it a little bit faster, or you can leave it overnight to cool. Just make sure by touching the outside, just make sure it's cool enough to be put into your mixture. And how much starter tea do you leave is another question. Well, you have your pH testing strip, so you can always make sure that your pH is low enough once you've added the sweet tea to the starter tea to the SCOBY. But a good ratio would probably be, I don't know, about a cup of starter tea per every four cups, I would say, of new sweet tea. So that'll keep the pH low enough, I would say. If you are a little bit paranoid and you really, you don't want mold and you just, you want it to brew faster and you want to keep the pH very, very low, I would go ahead and say one cup per two or three cups of new stuff. So one cup starter tea for every two cups of new tea that you're putting in. That would be a great ratio. That's a very safe ratio. That means that your new batch of kombucha is going to be mostly kombucha already and that's going to help the process along. So. There are many different methods to brewing. Some people will leave the sweet tea and the starter tea and the scoby for only like three or four days and they're gonna like to drink it really, really sweet. And that's their own personal preference. I personally think that you're not getting all the benefits. It hasn't finished brewing. It's not totally kombucha yet. Uh, if you do that, you're mostly drinking sweet tea and you're gonna get a lot of that sugar and it hasn't been processed yet. So if you want really vinegary kombucha, you're gonna wanna wait one week, two weeks, maybe even three weeks until you harvest. And of course you can take off little bits and put it back, but just remember that every time you pour it off, you're disturbing your SCOBY and you're gonna grow another layer. And one way to avoid this is to get a continuous brew system. You may have heard of this. Uh, a lot of people are selling these ceramic coolers and they've got plastic spouts. I personally have one. I have a continuous brew and I have a glass jar brew, but Word of advice, the ceramic is difficult just because you want to know the source of where you're getting this ceramic vessel from. If they use hazardous chemicals in the glazing process, that's really bad because kombucha will leach chemicals. So if you trust the person that you're getting it from and the company says to you, our glazes don't have lead, they don't have hazardous metals, it's okay, that's great. So it's just, it's your discretion. You have to figure out what you want. The reason that the continuous brew is awesome is because you have your kombucha set up and you have your spigot and you're able to take stuff out at any point and you're not having to pour it. You're not having to move the scoby out. You're not having to, you know, pour it and try to keep the scoby in. You're not disturbing it. You're not creating a new layer every time you take some out. It's good for people who want to drink it and can have it at different stages. It's good for people who want to test out their kombucha a lot. And it's just, it's very convenient. The only problem that I would say is people sell these continuous brew systems for up, uh, you know, upwards of $100 on their kombucha website or eBay or whatever, and it's really not necessary. I found my ceramic uh, cooler. I think it was like $35 on eBay, and I emailed the company, and they said to me, you know, we don't use any of those bad metals, and it's safe for the kombucha brewing. So the one that I got was very inexpensive, and if I can find it online, I'll post the link below just to help you guys out. I don't want you to have to spend that much money. $100 is way too much. If you're going to be spending that much, it's kind of like, I don't know, you might as well just, I don't, never mind. So what else? What other questions would you have? Lindsay was asking me how to get it very vinegary because she said that recently the ones that she's been having uh, store-bought are just too sweet and she doesn't like that. The reason that yours has been really sweet, Lindsay, is because they're not taking enough time to brew it. When you brew it at home, you're just going to leave it in longer. You can do a dill taste sample. You can see if you like it. If it's too sweet, just leave it in longer. If you're in a warm climate, it's going to the process will take less time. It's going to happen faster. And if you're in a colder climate, it's going to take a little more time to brew. Um, the best places to leave your kombucha are maybe in a cabinet above the fridge, somewhere out of the way where it's not going to get knocked into. Your bedroom is a great place because there's no cooking, smokes and oils, and 
it's probably not seeing that much ruckus activity, or maybe it is, but um, yeah, I mean, just a nice place that's out of the way, pets, kids, house guests aren't going to be messing with it. That's the ideal spot. And how to handle your SCOBY, how let's get into that. Some people like to wash out their jars, similar to having a pet in an aquarium. You're gonna, from time to time, want to wash out the um, the brown strands and the the goop that arises. So this stuff is nothing to be grossed out by. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's not a problem with your kombucha, but you're gonna have strands of brown and yeast from time to time. You can clean out your jar simply by pouring everything into a new clean glass jar and then, you know, washing it out with soap. And then what you like to do is do a vinegar rinse with white vinegar because you want to make sure that there's not any residual soap or things like that. You always want to make sure that once you've cleaned something, any material that's going to be touching your SCOBY should have a vinegar rinse, very thorough water rinse, and then a finally to follow it up, a vinegar rinse. And you're just going to want to make sure that that takes out all the rest of everything. And then that's how you clean your vessel. SCOBYs like to be touched with wood or plastic materials. You don't want to use a metal spoon. You don't want to use a ladle, anything that is metal based because that can mess with your SCOBY in a weird way. Uh, girls, if you've ever dyed your hair, you know that bleach similarly does not like to be touched by metal. So SCOBY's like that. SCOBY doesn't like heat, extreme cold, smoke, dirt, dander. It doesn't like metal. And it does not like certain essential oils. And just to be safe, remember, if you're going to be flavoring your kombucha, you don't put that flavoring directly in contact with your SCOBY ever, okay? What you do is you siphon off what you want to harvest, and then you add the flavoring to that. I've already said it, but it's very important. People lose their SCOBYs every week because of just careless mishaps and getting overly confident and wanting to go out there and save time, cut corners, put a bunch of like ginger directly in the mix. That's, it might be okay, but it's just, it's not worth it. You know, you don't want to do that. And there's really no point in flavoring your, your entire mix. Just take off what you want from the brew, leave the, leave the brew alone. And then just, yeah. So what else about, let me think. I want to make this the most thorough kombucha video maybe even ever made. So, okay, let's just talk about SCOBYs a bit because they seem to freak people out. So your SCOBY, your symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast is something that looks like a translucent pancake. It's like a jellyfish material. It kind of looks like raw chicken breast. I know that's a disgusting simile. But I just remember from my childhood this, like, ugh. Anyway, um, it's like this translucent circle that can be anywhere from this thick to this thick, depending. And it's going to have layers. It's going to be kind of like a, a white, maybe a little bit pink tinge, just getting dyed from all that caffeine and tea and stuff. And it's a thing of beauty. It really can just... Uh, I don't know. I I love my SCOBY personally. I respect them so much. It's like a member of the family, as crazy as that sounds. But your SCOBY is a thing of pride and beauty, and it's it's able to do so much that it's just a wonderful thing. So, sharing with friends. People like to peel their SCOBYs, and you can either have three batches going in a continuous formation. If you don't want to go and get the cooler, you can always have a small jar and a small jar and a small jar, and you have them staggered, so they're each giving you kombucha at different stages. Does that make sense? You're going to brew one one week, and that one won't be ready for a while, so you set it off to the side, and then you have this one that's almost ready, and then you have your other one that is ready currently. So you have this one, this one, this one staggered in different stages, kind of like a compost bin. And that will make sure that you have kombucha that's ready at any given point. Another thing that you can do is when you're ready to uh, harvest your kombucha, you can pour it off into bottles. And then you know those snap lids? I don't know what they're actually called, sorry. But they've got the metal and the, the cork, and then you just... Whoop. So you can put them in those, and you can put them off to the side on your kitchen counter, and that will help the carbonation er, process. 
So how do you get your kombucha really carbonated? You're going to want to give it an environment where it is airtight and where it is under pressure. So similar to being shipped, part of the reason that the store-bought kombucha is so fizzy is because it's been in this bottle for a few days for transport. So what you do is you pour your kombucha into those bottles and it should also be glass. Don't put your kombucha in plastic, okay? Just glass, clear glass is the best. So you're gonna put it in the bottle, don't leave a lot of air space, click down your thing, put it off to the side, wait a day, try it, maybe wait two days, three days, and you will be amazed at how fizzy it gets. So invest in a few of those reusable bottles, they're awesome. And with that method, you'll have kombucha available to you in a more continuous state because you can drink it, you know, soon or you can drink it later, and that's good. Uh, sharing your scobies with friends is a great way to get good karma and to share the benefit with everybody. So each time you get your new scoby forming, your baby, you can give that away if you want. Some people eat them. Some people blend them into a shampoo. Uh, some people compost them in the garden, and that's all fine. You can either have a 100 batches going or you can start giving them out to friends, give them out online, you know, use Craigslist. I see that a lot. You could start your own business where you're selling people scobies. I think it's the best thing to teach people how to do it themselves and not have to sell them anything. So giving away scobies is awesome. It's just a good way to get good universe points and spread the kombucha love. Let me think if there are any more questions. Yeah, so how to flavor your kombucha. That's simple. You can use fresh fruit, fruit juices, um, I like to grate up ginger. Basically, if you go to the store and you see what flavorings people have offered on the shelves, you can recreate that at home, and it'll probably be even better. So, of course, you don't want to add the flavorings to the SCOBY. You already know that. I'm, like, hammering it in, right? But what you want to do is you want to add that later. So you can take your raspberries or your cut up apples or whatever it is and you just add it and then you click it down or you just drink it then and that'll be good. And let me think, let me think, let me think. So you already know how often you're going to be putting in your new starter tea, right? Maybe I'll talk about that process a little bit more um, just to make sure that everybody's clear on it. So, once you have your SCOBY formed in your, at this point, very acidic starter tea, you are going to want to add your sweet tea mixture. So you brew your sweet tea in a separate glass container, you wait till it's room temperature, and then you just simply pour it on, and your SCOBY may sink to the middle of the mixture at any given point. That's okay. It'll probably rise up again at some point just because it's carbonated, and that'll push it up. If it doesn't, if it's kind of lopsided or it's just sitting in the middle, that's absolutely fine. Please don't worry about it, okay? It doesn't mean anything. A lot of times SCOBY will sit at the surface though, so it's just what your SCOBY's feeling like that day, to be honest. Um, so you've added the sweet tea mixture and you've maybe hopefully checked the pH just to make sure that you still have a good pH level. If it were to rise uh, too high and for some reason your SCOBY reading is like I don't know, like a seven or something, very neutral. If I were you, I would go to the store and I would buy a new bottle of raw kombucha and add that just to lower the pH again because you really, you don't want neutral. Neutral's no good. It's going to grow mold within a few days and you should definitely check visually every so often just to make sure that you don't have mold. It's, it's not something that happens randomly for no reason. If you get mold, it means that you were a little bit careless and you let your pH get way too high and maybe you let some nasty bacteria in. So make sure your hands are clean when you're touching your SCOBY. Make sure that the, the uh, wooden uh, the wooden utensils that you're using are clean. Make sure everything's clean and you'll sh you should be fine. It, it doesn't happen for no reason. Don't worry about it. Don't get paranoid that you're going to get mold. It just uh, One thing that happened is my ex-boyfriend left his lid off and he grew maggots on his scoby and he didn't even notice. I came over one time and I was like, how's everything going? And I checked it out and I said, you do know that there's larvae growing on your scoby, right? And he was like, no, I would never have noticed that because they were very small and they were moving around. 
So that just means at one point a fruit fly got his little fruit fly situation down in there. So if you're ever messing with your SCOBY or harvesting or cleaning the jar, you want to keep it covered. You don't want to give them an opportunity to do that because flies are very attracted to this. So make sure that you are not letting them get into your SCOBY. Simple as that. Just don't leave it uncovered for minutes at a time with your back turned. You just want to make sure that it's always got its reusable dishcloth over it and then that's as much effort as you need to put in. Hopefully now you understand how to grow your SCOBY and your kombucha. And if there's anything that I forgot, I'm happy to make another one. A 30 minute video should be enough. I should have been succinct enough to get everything in there. Are there any more tips? I gave you the basic ratios. Remember, it's not an exact science. If you would feel more comfortable using a very specific regiment uh, recipe, you can go online. There are numerous, countless articles on how to do this, and I'm just trying to make a basic a basic tutorial guide for you to get the confidence to go out and try this yourself. I have another kombucha video, you're welcome to watch it, I will put the link below. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to write them here. If you want a response more quickly, you can go ahead and message homesteading. I'm always happy to help. In fact, a woman started brewing kombucha one time and she had some problems and I gave her my cell phone number and we ended up talking on the phone about it. So I am really, really looking to help you do this. I think it's a great endeavor and you may not like the taste. Here's, okay. If you want the benefit of kombucha, but you're not into the vinegarness, I understand that in the beginning, I didn't like it very much either. And the way that you can get around that, if you still want to try to drink it, is to, I would say first, brew it a little bit less time. The flavor will be less intense. And additionally, you can dilute it heavily. You can have a little bit of kombucha in a very, very great thing of new tea or fruit juice or I don't know what else you could put it in. Something, something good like maybe chai tea would be delicious, something like that. And if you dilute it, you won't be getting that flavor as strongly. You can put it over ice. Um, you can add it to recipes. It can be used in different foods, I know that. And yeah, so this is just a good way to get fermented foods and probiotics into your system and it's my hope that everyone out there who drinks kombucha will not only drink it but brew it themselves because it's something that is simple, very cost effective, and easy to do at home. And I'm going to think for a second just to make sure there's nothing I forgot. Hmm. That's the way that you get the scoby going. Keeping the jar clean, continuous brewing. The things that would hurt the scoby. I guess something that's worth mentioning is I think I said this, but I don't like to handle my scoby very much. Some people will take it out and they'll mess with it and they'll appreciate it and enjoy it like that and they'll set it on a paper plate or whatever while they are cleaning out their jar. Personally, I like to handle it as little as possible. I, it might be a little bit like germaphobic or a little too tentative, but I, I just don't feel comfortable touching it. I don't think that as many times as I wash my hands, I don't think they're clean enough to handle the SCOBY. I really want it to be pure and unmessed with. So what I will do is if I ever need to clean the jar out, I'll get a second clean jar, dump everything in that one, and then clean, and then pour it back or whatever. But I... I just, I don't like to touch her, I'm sorry. So I hope that that answers all your questions and I will make another video happily if you guys request it. That's basically everything you would ever, ever need to know and a lot of things that you would never wanna know, but now you're versed in kombucha. Here's a quiz. What does SCOBY stand for? Hopefully you knew that. Uh, let me think. What are some of the hazards of buying ceramic vessels for your SCOBY? Hopefully you knew how to answer that one. Uh, metal, good or bad? Bad. So if you get a 
glass cooler from a place like Walmart or the thrift store or whatever, I've noticed a lot of glass coolers have metal spigots. So hopefully that was a red flag in your mind. I uh, thought it would bring it up just in case. I've seen a lot of glass that has plastic. That's what you want. For some reason, plastic is better. Metal, it, the acidity will just leach out a lot of bad stuff and probably a similar situation with plastic. To be honest, the only two things that I would recommend using in direct contact with your kombucha would be glass and approved ceramic material. And unfortunately, there's really no other thing that I'm aware of for your spigot material besides plastic or metal, so just use plastic and hope that it's okay. To be honest, I was talking to a local brewer the other day and um, I said, I would love to talk to you about your scobies and your kombucha. I have tried your brand before, you know, I really like it. And we got to talking and I asked him how big the scobies were because I was always curious on a large scale when you're producing it, how big are the scobies? Because they can get as big as your container. So I'm thinking there's like a kiddie pool sized one out there somewhere in a huge glass container. And he said something that was really, it made me distraught. He said, yeah, we have them going in like these five gallon buckets. And I thought to myself, that's plastic. Like, I know that there's BPA-free food grade plastic out there, but that's for, like, housing millet or maybe vegetables. Like, you should not, you should not be using plastic for anything that has a low pH like that. So I, I was really confused by that. I think that that's a bad idea. And the fact that I bought this brand before at a reputable store and they're using plastic to brew their kombucha, it doesn't make any sense to me. So that is something that is another factor that contributes to me wanting to brew my own. Besides being cost effective and you get to put exactly what you want, you know that the tea is organic if that's what you choose, you know that the sugar is organic, you know exactly how much sugar you're using, you can wait and specify the taste having to do with how long you're brewing it. All of that stuff is important, and also the safety factor. You know where it's coming from. If you're using glass and you know that everything is very sanitary in your house and you're a stickler for that, that's something that you want to be in control of. The fact that these people are using plastic to brew is a little bit of a problem, I would say. So luckily he said that they were going to upgrade soon to these much bigger 5-gallon, or no, he said 5-gallon. He said they were going to upgrade to like 20-gallon something, like glass vats. So that's good at least, but yeah. Okay, so I hope that you love kombucha and you want to brew your own and you're inspired to go do, you know, go out and do it this weekend. You can have something as small as a rinsed out reusable pasta jar or you could invest in something that's like a gallon jar. That would be awesome. Remember that anything, as long as it's a clear glass, should work. And if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm happy to talk to you more. Okay, thanks. Happy brewing!